similar to uh, um, welcome uh, Jerita Holbrook, Dr. Jerita Holbrook, uh, who was uh, one of the early uh, black US PhDs in astronomy and astrophysics, um, uh, hopefully of a, of a long stream coming and who has been uh, specializing next to her work in, um, in observational astronomy and star forming regions in a uh, great many issues to do with the relationship between culture, diversity and astronomy and who will be educating us on that topic. Um, Jarita has been a member of a, a number of international and national committees responsible for exploring those issues and helping us navigate them. And so she is going to share with us some of the wisdom that she has gained in all that work. So thanks once again, Jarita, for being with us and please take the floor. Thank you so much. And good to see a few friends on this uh zoom all right i will start by sharing my screen make sure that works so i'm going to be talking about my latest project which is uh, astro moves and i'm currently in the department of science technology and innovation studies at the university of edinburgh so i'm sitting in a very rainy scotland today all right, so I often start, oh, that went really weird, uh, by saying that I uh, use Teresius Infofont, and this is a very nice image of the castle. This is Edinburgh Castle from Holyrood Park. Um, so who is Teresius? Teresius the blind seer in Greek, Greek mythology. So this is a freely accessible font. And I'm not sure if anyone on the, the Zoom today is vision impaired, but uh, it's, it's supposedly the best for people who have uh, reading difficulties. So I encourage everybody to use it. It's freely accessible online. So what is Astro Moves? This is the full on official title, a qualitative study of the career decisions of astrophysicists relocation, life work balance, and reputations. It's funded by um, Horizon 2020, Marie Slagowska Curie Action, and I'm a Career Restart Fellow. So Astro Moves determines the what, where, and why for career moves among astrophysicists and those in adjacent scientists. When it was proposed, it was proposed that I would do face-to-face -face interviews at conferences. I tend to do a lot of my work at astrophysics conferences but of course COVID happened and so that changed to doing interviews online which I resisted for a very long time at least four or five months I was so hoping that COVID would be managed and I could go to face to face but that was not the case so I moved to online and I, I I'll show you how I sampled people but I interviewed people is the, the number one way that I collect data is I interview people and that's called qualitative research. And once I have the interviews, I prepare the interviews for analysis by assigning everyone a Hawaiian pseudonym. I was born in Hawaii. So I think that as an astrophysicist born in Hawaii, that we need to spread the world word to other astrophysicists that they should be forever thankful to the Hawaiian people for letting us use Mauna Kea for, you know, and Haleakala for our astronomical observations. So I turned everybody into Hawaiians for this project. Then I transcribe the uh, interviews. The, and that was a positive thing because if you do an interview on Zoom or Teams or, you know, I think the first few months of, of the, the pandemic, this wasn't a feature, but, you know, by about four or five months into the pandemic, it transcribes anything you record. Excuse me. So I didn't have to actually pay for transcription. It automatically transcribed. Of course, I have to, I have to correct the transcription but at least I got the initial transcription. And then I had to reformat everything to go into the qualitative coding software, which in 
the case of University of Edinburgh, it's in vivo. That's just what they provide. There's other qualitative coding software. Some are better, some are worse. I had to use what was free for me. This is what the uh, program looks like when you're using it. And you here are the interviews. And here is the video from one of the interviews. And here is the sound file from one of the interviews. Here is the text. And then here are the codes that I assigned to various parts of the text. So that's what a qualitative uh, coding software, co software for coding looks like when I'm doing my work. So these are probably familiar to everybody. How, what happens after your, you get your PhD as you're navigating your career? And if you want to stay on the research track and eventually become a permanent faculty member or a professor or a senior senior researcher at like NASA. So it's pretty standard to go through one, two, and sometimes three postdocs before you get to temporary faculty. And then you have to go through some sort of a, a promotion process to become permanent faculty. And then as permanently permanent faculty, you then apply some years later to move into senior faculty, which would be professor. All right, so, oh, and then there's the magic lines, because sometimes you can jump. You can jump from postdoc to permanent, or, uh, or you know, any, any, any of these combinations can be jumped, um, but it's not very common that they're jumped. Usually it's one or two postdocs, then temporary, permanent, senior. So I wanted to show this, this was just published, I think last month, and it shows that astronomy jobs are on the rebound was the name of this short thing on the internet. Let me um, take a sip, I do, I'm about to cough, hold on. So I showed this for two reasons. I think because most of the people on this Zoom are connected to astrophysics, they know how bad the job market is, that there's plenty of postdocs, very few permanent positions. And you can see that uh, it's very tight. So in, in this one, uh, the permanent positions or the temporary permanent positions are the red. So this is the line. And this is from the, the job ads that were posted through the American Astronomical Society. And this is the line for temporary, you know, postdoc positions, right? So these are short-term contracts. So there's far, far more postdocs than there are permanent positions. So I wanted to show this. I like this because it really illustrates what the job market looks like. There's very few um, temporary permanent positions that will lead to a permanent position compared to the number of postdocs. And also, I wanted to show the drop in the job market due to COVID, where the dashed line is, right? That there was a visible drop. So who gets interviewed? So I will go ahead and play this little clip. And um, I'm looking at you, Ralph. Thumbs up so, if you could hear it. Of course, you can be told this, but in terms of actually understanding it, it's completely different, right? I mean, I remember the the first thing I, I was when I was an undergrad at University of Arizona. Like all of um, we were often told, oh, the chances of ending up in the faculty position is maybe one in a thousand. But we, you know, the hubris and naivete of youth were like, well, we'll be that one thousand. <laughs> even though, even though we saw the attrition as 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 you move through your cohort of years, you know, you started out with nominally U of A has a very well established astronomy program. You start out with a hundred astronomy majors. By the time you graduate, it was maybe ten. So that was already a factor of 10. I mean, just to get to grad school. Well, okay, sorry. No, those are the numbers who went on to graduate school, which of course at the time was the only way that counted, which is by the way, completely ridiculous. And I don't subscribe to that attitude at all, but that's essentially how the department looked at it. It's like how many of our students are graduating. Um, so there's that number. So that was probably a factor to higher. Honestly, I don't know. I, I should have asked at some point. Um, but then how many actually then went on to go into grad school, which is what kind of counted 
And I mean, I can remember that uh, our year or the years around me, they, they were considered really good because there were four or five people who went on to grad school. And that was considered unusual. And that's for a very large established astronomy program, as you know, because you were, you were at U of A um, and you were as well. So. All right. So who gets interviewed? I take volunteers and usually when I give a talk like this, there's somebody in the audience who's like, oh, Jarita, interview me. Stop it. I'm finished, finished doing interviews for this project. But um, anyone can volunteer to be interviewed except for not now. Um, I also had targeted recruitment because I wanted to have people who were not heterosexual. So I went to the astronomy out list and I found people who were in Europe. And when I proposed my project, I already had assurances from 14 people who were gender diverse saying that they would allow me to interview them if I got the money. And I think it really strengthened my application. And then what I found was, you know, Kim, Kim V. Tron, who this is an image of her, is Asian American. I found that in my sample, I was low on Asians, people of Asian descent. So I then did target it, trying to find people of Asian descent who would be part of my study. So it was a combination of just volunteers. Um, when I showed this or talked about my research, additional volunteers would come and then targeted, targeted for, um, as I said, Asians and for um, gender diverse. The requirement was that they had to be two career moves past PhD, but I also was looking for people who had a European con connection. Either they had done a postdoc in Europe, had done their PhD in Europe, or were from Europe because it's European Union money. Um, and I relaxed that later on. And there was three levels of consent. You could be in the film. So everyone that you're going to see today has agreed to be in the film or you could be completely anonymous, or you could be at a, an in-between state of those two. So that's Kim V. Tron. So she's Asian American. She has a career age of 19 years, which I'll explain what career age is. She's married. She's a dual academic couple. So thus they had the famous two body problem. She's had three postdocs and three permanent positions. The European connection was she held two postdocs and one faculty position in Europe. She still works abroad in Australia, and she had two faculty positions abroad, both in Switzerland and Australia, but actually she tenured in the United States. This is what her map looks like. And when I first started to do the Astro Moves, I used to create these maps. And then um, I decided that, you know, I have nearly 50 people there's no way that I can show 50 maps in a publication. So I decided I'm probably just wasting my time making these maps, but they are interesting because, you know, we know where the places that are really good for theory, where they're good for um, observational astronomy. So you can see people clustering around those places. So intersectionality, you may have heard this term. Uh, most of you should be familiar with it, and it captures the fact that holding several identities actually multiply in discriminatory, discriminatory situations. So myself being black and woman, it's more than being black and more than being a woman. It's like 30 times more, something like that. That's what intersectionality tries to capture. So for Astro Moves, I want to talk about some of the intersectional identities for, of these 50, nearly 50 people. So several of them have invisible disabilities. Some are invisible minorities. So on the outside, they're, they're perceived as being European or white American, but actually they're from an, an ethnic minority group. They just appear to be that way. Some are hiding their sexuality and gender identity. So some are in fact bisexual, but um, they're currently with the opposite, the normal opposite sex. So they're getting all the, the benefits of being in a heterosexual relationship, even though they consider themselves to be bisexual. 
things like that. And when I was talking about class, most of the time astronomers don't talk about class. Most of the time, most people don't talk about class. Therefore, we must talk about class. When I'd say, you know, what class are you? I'd say nearly 100% would say middle class. And so I'd have to prompt them by saying, do you mean upper middle class, middle middle class, or lower middle class? So, and then they would differentiate. And then they'd tell me why. And here's another thing. We talked about finances, which is most astronomers, you know, studies of astronomers, they don't talk about finances. So, um, but most of them, most of the, most of the 50 people came out of the PhD not having any serious debt. So very privileged, two levels of privilege. One is that they're mostly claiming middle class, and the second is they're mostly saying they had no debt coming out of grad school. So here's what the demographics looked like in July. So in July, there were 44. Ralph, do you want to ask a question now, but can you wait until the end? Oh, if you prefer, that's fine, yes. Yeah, hold it for the end. I'll keep your hand up, but you'll be the first question. All right, so for the, um, for now it's nearly 50 people, so this is already out of date. Okay, so there, this was 41 people. You can see their combination, sexuality and gender. So sex and sexuality, heterosexual females, heterosexual males, and LGBTQIA plus members. Um, the career age is measured by how many years since their PhD. It's the age that matters for the, a study like this. Also, um, it's more than just astrophysicists. There are some people from adjacent scientists, including computer science working in astrophysics, you know, engineering working in astrophysics. So here's how the career age broke down. Um, the heterosexual females were 13 years, heterosexual males slightly older, and the LGBTQIA are about the same as the heterosexual females. So we're skewing a little bit high for the heterosexual males in terms of career age. Now, I have three quotes and three film clips. So this one is from Hima. Again, pseudonym, Hawaiian pseudonym means South. I can only say about being gay. I don't feel like there was any place that I was considering going to that would, wouldn't have chosen, that I wouldn't have chosen because of its reputation for being homophobic. For instance, I come from blank country where I was bullied heavily when I was growing up. So my definition of homophobia and my definition of bullying might be different from somebody else's definition of bullying. So for me, I'm in Europe. Europe is a free country. That's what he said. <laughs> I'm protected. You know, I feel safe. You know, I run around and drag sometimes and it's totally cool. Nobody cares. So even though uh, they said that they um, would not pick a place that, or would not go to a place that was known for being homophobic. They were actually in a place that was not homophobic. Uh, so let's talk about spouse and children. This is Brian Mendez. You know, my, what my wife and I tried to figure out was, you know, the basic things like, okay, do we need to sell the house, right? You know, that's one of the questions is like, okay, you know, what are our biggest expenses? We're not sure where the next paychecks, how long will be before another paycheck comes in. Do we need to sell the house or do we need to refinance? You know, we, we started looking at those things. What about the health insurance? Because all the health insurance is right now through me and the university. Do we need to switch that over to her through her school district? You know, so we started looking at those things and trying to plan them out. I'm a big time planner. I build budgets and, <laughs> and, and long documents and everything, trying to figure out what the next step is going to be. Um, and, you know, and the one thing that I would always tell my wife is, look, we're, don't worry, we're not going to be homeless, right? We're never going to be living in our car. We're not going to, like, I'm not too proud to not just go get a job flipping burgers if need be, right? I can bag, you know, if, if, if we need a paycheck and, you know, I can't figure out what the next thing is going to be, 
you know, <laughs> I can, I can, I can drive Uber. I, you know, I, I, I can do anything to actually bring in money. And I'm not, you know, I'm not one of these people like, oh, if I don't get, if I don't get my high paying job at a university, then we're going to be on unemployment. No, it's like, <laughs> that's, that's definitely not me. So, um, so I never had that kind of worry, you know, like, yeah, don't worry. We're going to, we're going to be okay. It's just like, I didn't know how we were going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, and that was probably where most of my anxiety came from was just the, how are we going to do it? How are we going to make it work? I never worried that we wouldn't make it work. Right. Okay. So this shows the complexity of decision-making when you have a family and a spouse and, and children. Uh, most of the people were buried in my sample and many of them had children. So they often, and what we found is that usually with studies of astrophysicists in their career decision making, it's a snapshot. They've been doing this by survey and I'm the first one to do it by interview. And so it's a snapshot and they're like, okay, you know, I'm interested in the place that gives the most science. And then I'm looking for the career advancement opportunities. And, you know, there's a list. But what I found in my research is that changed over time. So for the first, first postdoc, people tended to pick the best science, like, oh, this is going to be the best for my career, blah, 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 blah. But then when they got, you know, by the second and third postdoc, they're no longer single. They're married and or have children. And so that changes, the priority changes over time. Great, let's go to the next one. So here's Brian Mendez's points. He talked about finances, he talked about the house, he talked about health insurance, he talked about spouse, and he talked about the willingness to work in a non-research position. And also Brian Mendez, who appears to be European, is actually a, an under member of an underrepresented group in the United States. He's Mexican American. Another one. This is a complicated one for me to read, so I'm going to paraphrase it. So this is Kahiku, who is one of the the my uh, interviewees who was lower class, who said, "I'm lower class." You know, most people don't want to claim lower class, but they were absolutely fine with claiming lower class. And because of being lower class, they came out of graduate school with debt. And because of that debt, how they navigated their career was different from the people who did not have debt. Uh, so in, at this moment in Kahiku's uh, career, they made the decision to leave uh, the academic research track and this is their internal logic. They were thinking, okay, I really don't want to leave academia. I want to research or stay in research. But if they give me a job, if they offer me a position that pays this much money, then I'm really going to have to consider leaving because that's a lot of money and that would solve a lot of problems. And in fact, the offer came in higher than that threshold. So that was why Kahiku left um, the research track in or, and took this um, other type of position because of money. So here's in the population that I have, how many people have left the research track and how many have stayed. And these are just numbers. There's nothing statistical about it until I do a deeper analysis. Right, and here's our very own Tana. These places, interestingly enough, there was this one job that kept coming up and it's, in terms of science, it was a perfect fit. But my supervisor, who is a white American, uh, US American man, had to sit down and have a slightly awkward conversation with me. At the time I was dating a white Irish guy and he said to me, this university is in, this, it's in, this, uh, in the deep south um, in the state of the of the US. And while I think you will be fine on your own, you and your boyfriend will not be fine when you are there together. So as much as I agree with you that this would be a fantastic postdoc for you research wise, life wise, I don't think that this is the right move for you. Wow. Okay. So um, this is something that 
I mean, if you're European, maybe you don't think about these things when you're navigating your career. But this is something that um, as you know, people of color, we have to, to think about. And uh, there's another issue like that's that's like an extreme the extreme issue of, you know, are you going to live in the historical south of the United States? And what Tana said was really resonated with me because my husband absolutely refuses to live in the historical south of the United States. I was like, you know, it's not so bad. And he's like, no, <laughs> absolutely will not consider any, any jobs in the historical south of the United States. And other people in Europe, of course, are making decisions not to go to places because of anti-European sentiment, like during the Trump years. And of course, Brexit in the UK. So that's not quite as salient as being in a racist environment, but it still can be an uncomfortable situation. So they are making decisions not to go to places for political reasons, as well as for intersectional identity. So this is how my population breaks down by by ethnic identity, European dis descent. You know, I was aiming for Europe, so that's not a surprise. I have Middle Easterns, I have African descent, Asian descent, and mixed others. So mixed people are people like from Brazil, uh, where they're a melange, they're European, they're indigenous, they're African mixed together. So which quote is this one? Um, yes. All right. I'm not sure if I can read this whole thing, but I'll give it a, give it a, give it a shot. To be honest, coming back to the USA is actually what I didn't want to. Being a black male in the U.S., it's a difficult thing than being a black, and then being a black intellectual, meaning on top of that, being a black academic, being a black astronomer, being a black physicist, that doesn't mean that it's not an issue in other places, but in the U.S., I think it is pretty unique. The U.S. didn't invent racism, but maybe they perfected it. You can hate me. You don't have to like me. I don't care about that. Just don't use your power that you have to put roadblocks in my way. You know, because that's really what racism is, and that's something that doesn't get talked about enough. It's not that people don't like you because you're black or even sexism. What it really is, is that it's the exploitation of a power dynamic. They have a preconceived notion that what you, about what you're capable of, what your capabilities are, about what you'd be interested in, about what you could do, all these things. They are preconceived about where you should be able to get to in life. And then when you demonstrate that you're actually much more than what they perceive, they then use their power to try to force you to remain circumscribed with, within their understanding of what you should be. So that's like a powerful quote. So in looking at the, the whole set of Astro moves, um, there were unexpected things that emerged and unexpected diversities and commonalities. For example, two of my interviewees were adopted and one of them was quite candid about how being adopted impacted almost every choice they made. Five of, of my people have been stalked. Five. It's like I was not trying to get stalk, people who have been stalked, but this just emerged from, from doing the interviews. Most have imposter syndrome. And many men tend to own a home. Some women own a home. Most have strong emotions around having to be on the, the astrophysics job market, including being indignant and resentful. And many have autoimmune invisible disabilities, which I talked about earlier. So what can we say about intersectionality and navigating careers? So people avoided, uh, they avoided places where women will be harassed. So that's an avoidance at a departmental level. Avoided places where being part of a mixed couple could be bad. That was Tana. 
that was a regional level. Avoid homophobia, again, regional level. Across demographics, they were anchored by family or owning a house or if they were married with kids. And across demographics, they moved for family. Once they became part of a family, they moved for family. Um, the population that I'm studying is largely under 65 years old. So I think 70 might be the oldest person. So we're not at the issue where they were talking about taking care of their parents, their elderly parents. So at a regional level, I mentioned before that the USA under Trump and the UK under Brexit, these have become, these were areas that were avoided. And at the department level, several people left positions early because of a negative climate. So these are some of the intersectional, um, intersectional issues, issues having to do with intersectional identity and navigating their careers. Okay. Um, most of these things that I've talked about, I've already written about. And so they're archived on archive.org. Um, including the introduction to the project with preliminary results on gender with respect to finances and unemployment. Early in my research, I found that most women, mo many, many, many women have been on unemployment or unemployed without pay, whereas a few men were, I think two or three have been on unemployment. Most of them have had continuous employment. Um, there are, there's two other papers, the COVID and navigating astral careers and emotional load of navigating astral careers, which I think are on archive. COVID and, and navigating astral careers is not on archive, but that's gonna come out very quickly. So those are my acknowledgements. And I wanted to spend the last few minutes showing you a clip of the documentary film. I've been doing nothing for a month except for editing all these interviews into a nice film. And I'm gonna show you this section, which is nine minutes on COVID. So if I turn off my, my um, microphone, will you still be able to hear the film? I'll try yes. it. If, okay. I actually had COVID uh, in August, so. You had it? No. So when I say the impact of COVID, COVID, you never thought this actually say I had COVID. <laughs> Not really, actually. <laughs> How bad was it? Uh, it wasn't super bad. It was very mild. Um, I think the, I had for roughly 10 days uh, quite strong joint and muscle pain. So I had to be on pain the whole time. Uh, apart from that, I was actually quite um, Quite okay. Um, I was like, you know, working from home the whole time, and um, the other symptom that was very annoying was like I lost completely my sense of taste and smell for maybe ten days, but came back quite quickly, so that was good. Um, my life has actually become better uh, because I have always appreciated a lot teleworking. Um, in Arizona, I did 100% telework. Um, the reason was that in Arizona, they, well, they do not have the same work protection, labor protection laws in the U.S. than in Europe. It is allowed to assign an office without a window in the U.S. That to me was unacceptable. Um, yeah, Carol made actually the same face. And, you know, Carol with your Oxford sense of humor says, so you're going to see less sun in Arizona than you ever saw in Oxford. <laughs> I said, no way. So I work from home. I got myself a nice place, a sunny place with a pool and everything, uh, and work from home. And I was very productive that way. Uh, when I started ESA in 2009, I asked, would it be possible that I do my research part, which was 20%, uh, that I do that from home? And they said, no, you have to clock in, work on site. That is a requirement because there's no legal basis for you to work from home. And the COVID now has, you know, from one day to the other, um, I didn't have to beg to work from home, but they forced me to work from home. <laughs> and that for me was, of course, really, really welcome. Um, fortunately, I, I bought a house that is 
large, has a garden and a pool and everything. So I have, I'm very autonomous here. I do not suffer. My husband also uh, lives here. Um, we have a, we also have a flat in Madrid, so we can also separate if needed. Um, so the, the work life conditions are really good and the work life balance has improved a lot with COVID for me. Uh, of course, that leaves out, uh, you know, feeling sorry for all those who, for whom it's difficult. It's depressing to see the news and all the people who suffer. Um, but I personally have not suffered from COVID. I think we're quite uncertain for a while. It was very distracting to keep doing the work. In particular, the emergence of the situation contrasted with the very abstract work that I do. It made my work, made my work to me to feel as if it was completely useless and obsolete because many other things were unfolding where people needed help and there was like things to be answered or to be asked and to be done. I, in terms of the pandemic, so one of the things that shifted a lot because I, I went to um, part-time work um, a few years ago, I started working more and more at home anyway because I needed to take my kids to school. I needed to be kind of close to the school, especially the first like couple of years because one of my sons, you know, he besides the autism, he's also got ADHD and his teacher really didn't know what to do with him. And I was getting phone calls like every hour. Can you talk to him? He's running out the door. Can you can you come over here and help us out? So I needed to be close. And um you know, and then I'd have to go pick them up after school, which, you know, is early. It's like two o'clock when they get done. And they both were having, um, we had uh, uh, people from Easter Seals coming to our home to provide uh, in-home services uh, for the boys after school, too. So it was just more convenient for me to, rather than spend the time commuting to campus, to sit around in my office for a couple of hours. It's like, all right, I can save all that time and just have a home office here. So I was already working from home almost all the time anyway. So when the pandemic hit, it was like, all right, well, I've already got <laughs> everything I need here. The big difference was now the rest of my family's here too. <laughs> so, you know, there were more distractions in the home than there used to be. You know, now I had to go help my kids with their, with their Zoom school and, you know, help my wife set up her Zoom. And there were times when all of us are Zooming at the same time and bandwidth was <laughs> a bit of an issue, right? But, um, I would say that that was kind of the biggest change for us. I mean, apart from that, it also kind of turned me into an introvert because now I'm all, I'm all, whenever I think about going out, I'm always like, do I have to, do I really need to go out? <laughs> Cause before, you know, oh, I'm hungry. All right. I'll just go over to, you know, and get a sandwich. And now I'm like, I'm hungry. Well, I think I, there's enough in the fridge. I can make myself a sandwich. <laughs> I don't need to go out for a sandwich. Um, COVID has, I mean, it's scuppered a lot of plans. That's everyone's tale for the first three months of lockdown, right? So um, just before I came back to the UK in February after spending six weeks in South Africa over Christmas, um, I did a talk radio interview with like the was highly rated, almost listened to talk radio station in Cape Town. And it went so well that the presenter came to me and he said, listen, do you think that you um, could do like a weekly slot of this? So that was like about to go down and everything. And then everything got dropped because of COVID. So there was a lot of moves being made behind the scenes. I didn't come to fruition. So one thing COVID has taught me is don't put too many eggs in too few baskets. Diversify identify your strengths and play to them. So that's why I'm doing a lot of these paid talks now, even though my bread and butter for my company as well was in-person talks at festivals, at corporate events, stuff like that. Um, diversifying to online events, online conferences. Um, and, and that is my strength is like speaking, but also being open to new opportunities. So I've just submitted my first paid for science article that I wrote. And I've always been like, I've always shied away from writing because I feel like speaking is my strong suit. But I also realized now with COVID, you have to take the money where you can. And now is an opportunity to develop a skill. I mean, I had my own strategies. I don't know, like, everybody has their own, their own um, challenges, their own stressors, their own strategies. I, I, start, I, I started running a lot. For a while, toward the beginning, I was running three miles every day. 
And I'm not a runner. Like I, I never really enjoyed running, but I just needed to be outside and like to see trees and to move because otherwise I was sitting in a room all day. And toward the beginning also when I was in uh, Canada, I, I got a foster cat and it was nice to, I got to touch a living being for a while. <laughs> <laughs> like that mattered so because other than I mean I didn't touch a human for like a year maybe not to the same like degree of necessity as me because for me it's basically imperative for my well-being to talk to people in person but definitely I feel like people were struggling with the idea of like you live alone and the world expects you to not talk to anyone I mean that's mm -hmm. If this, this is a kind of, I guess, a very personal question. It's not so much about the number of persons a day that I need to speak, it's more about the time of day. I can spend the entire day running around because I have a I have job, I have work to do, I have training in the evening after work, which requires a lot of my energy, as physical energy. But if I come home at 7 p.m. and I don't have a plan of seeing someone, that's what makes me feel really lonely. It's not so much about the number of people that I need to talk to, because I can talk to people at work all day, but if I'm home alone in the evening with nothing to do, that's the hard part for me. That's the vulnerable moment for me, is sort of being home alone in the evening with no one to talk to. Um, one thing that for sure has impacted a lot my work is the fact that most events were, I mean, all the events were canceled. And so it became really hard to connect with other researchers and to visit places and to advertise my own work, which might have played also in the fact that I didn't get any offer later on when I applied. All right, so that was that was it. Thank you Thank very you. much, uh, Jerita, for that uh, very interesting talk. Um, so um, I'm sure that this has given rise to lots of questions and and thoughts. So who can I give the floor to uh, uh, open the discussion? Well, I could start off with my uh, question while other people are thinking about what they would want to say. That's a um, lot to chew on. Yeah, a lot to chew the, on. The, the one that I was wondering about, it's more like a small technical thing, but you talked about class. Now, I, I, I know if you ask Dutch people about class, most of them initially won't even know what you mean. I mean, people are aware of there being people with high and low incomes, but class is one of the, how did you find across Europe? Uh, how easy, did you have to explain to people what that was? I didn't i didn't have to explain what it what it was but i what i wanted to get from them is what they saw as the markers of class so if they claimed a class i would say well tell me why do you say you're that class so in america it's very i think it's kind of standard and there's enough americans on this call that you guys can say yes or no that if you claim to be middle class that means at 16, you got your own car. Um, you may or may not have had savings for college. Um, so you could have taken out student loans. You tended to have had a job during the summers or um, during the last few years of your high, high school, that these are kind of markers of middle class. Whereas in, um, in the UK, the marker was did your family go on vacations every year? And that was kind of a, and also, oh, it was two, two things that I found. The other thing was that they, they had a different accent from the people that they lived around, right? So that was another marker of middle class. They didn't have the same, they didn't have a local accent. They had kind of a, a more posh accent because they went to better schools or and that was another thing so when people did tell me what their class was i would ask what what are the standards tell me why you you say that so i learned a lot about how people you know identified class okay thank you so who may i give the floor
Any Americans want to chime in on? Uh, Leah, I see your hand raised. Thank you. Yes. Hey, Greta. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this talk. It's so wonderful to be able to see um, to see you present. Um, so you know that I'm all about like friendship, and so I'm wondering if other social connections beyond marriage and children would sway people's decisions in their movement, um, particularly friendship, if that ever came up, or um, another possibility, of course, is like in my experience in academia, it just was sort of swept under the rug all the time. Like it seemed important to people, but was never um, made a priority in the decision making like that. So I'm wondering if that ever came up in your interviews. Right. So, um, of course, I know that people were making decisions based on, you know, I get along with such and such and such and such. But the only person that I can think of is actually my husband, Romil, who spoke about, you know, going to the decisions of where he applied. He particularly spoke about people that he got along with. Right. So Chris Impey was mentioned with the University of Arizona and, you know, another person was mentioned for Victoria, and, you know, so that he definitely took that into consideration. But I found that most people did not talk about their future colleagues when they were when they were describing their career moves, that Ramil was a little bit unusual. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Who else can I give the floor? I can perhaps uh, fire off another one, uh, uh, maybe slightly more philosophical. Uh oh. Well, what I always worry. <laughs> so th there's one general worry I have in these discussions about like people leaving academia and attrition, and that is that, of course. The primary goal of academia is to train people for other things than being academics, right? Because we are education institutions. We provide the basic education at higher level for everyone who is going to do something of sufficient technicality and responsibility in society. So in some sense, we can't call people leaving the field attrition. It's success. It's, it's what we are assigned to do. But then, of course, at some level, it isn't. And so, what, I mean, where where do you feel kind of that boundary uh, line is, or, or where where would you? So fortunately, what, what, what would you? I have what, you know. What should we consider fair? I I have nearly fifty people's opinions on this, right? Uh, how do they feel? The people, I think, uh, you saw, saw how many people considered themselves to have left. Um, the research track. And, you know, we had lots of discussions about lots of words about what that meant for them and their decisions. And do they regret or are they happier? Or, you know, uh, most of them did not feel like leaving the research track was a failure. Um, a few did. Um, and a, a, like, uh, so there was, there was a very odd, odd cases where um, uh, one of the things that I, I became, it became standard for me to ask is if they had been warned about how tight the job situation is before they started their PhD. And for, for a few people, I think it was three or four, they had not been warned. And therefore, when they ended up not getting the next postdoc, um, they were just, you know, like a deer in the headlight. They had no idea that the job market was just so, so tight for, for getting a permanent position. And so they were, you know, disappointed, unhappy, et cetera. But, but most of the people who did move out, uh, it was a long coming decision. Um, there's even, even people in my population who were tenured professors who were just like, I'm out, right? And they're doing something else, uh, something that's more stable, something that's more lucrative, um, and something near their families. So for them, um, and, and, you know, in some 
I, I would not say in most cases, I would not say in most cases they are unhappy, in most cases they're they are happy, but I'd say that those that range does exist and how they're feeling. Do they feel like they're failures or something went wrong or it's unfair or or do they feel like, oh, this is, you know, this is just the way it is. Okay, so, I, at some point you said that most people felt indignant or resentful about having to navigate the yes or job market but maybe yes. that means something slightly different so so no they could be what's the difference between those two things so the, of course they they have that those emotions they are angry and they're resentful that they have to keep doing this over and over again but not to the point that they stop okay right they they think that this system is just you know it's it's hard it's hard to to persevere in this system but they don't stop they don't stop okay right? so they'll talk about yeah it really is awful that you have to you know have a postdoc here and then you're expected to move and you know and uproot your whole family to go for your second postdoc you know they talk about those emotions of doing that right but they still do it okay thanks yeah Mm -hmm. So Jake, you have your hands raised. And there's something in the chat too. Oh, I do have my. That was the chat says someone. Unfortunately, oh. they have to leave. So okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I have a question, sort of along those same kind of lines as well. I'm also involved in a EU project that is called Start, and we're looking at transition from high school to first year undergrads and support that first year undergraduates get. And one thing that we found in focus groups from our astronomy first year undergrad students was that one of their largest challenges or stresses that they were feeling was that they'd heard that only 10% of people were going to be astronomers. And that in more of our discussion in the focus group, we learned that they interpret this to mean the best 10% are going to be astronomers or the best 15%, which is job one, we should point out to them, that's not necessarily true. <laughs> the 15% who become astronomers are spread across the whole range of the students, I think, and people do different things for different reasons. And all of the very, very best ones probably go and work for Google or something and make millions of euros. But um, the thing that we were, were then thinking about, we just had our first EU-wide meeting about it was how do we actually fit this into our education and training of students and at every level that it is okay to be doing other things that's still success if it's if it's what you're happy with then it is still successful and you should set your success up to be happy but the problem we see is that all of these academics teaching these students are all people who've done that and are still doing it so i don't know if you've got any thoughts about where or yes or i how have or why this can fit into your astronomy 101 class so first of all i have to point out the work of someone who i interviewed for this program um uh, dan dan Purley, and he did a an article that showed that uh even though you don't get a permanent position, you can have a long career in astrophysics. You can go from, you know, temporary position to temporary, you know, you can still have, you know, a 30 year career. It's just, you know, precarious. And so that the attrition is not as high. If you consider that you can, you know, you can have these, uh, these string a bunch of, you know, positions, positions together. So that's something to give a read about. Um, and there's, there's also, you know, uh, so I actually did a master's in astronomy before I did my PhD. And, um, okay, um, and the goal of that master's was for some of us to go on and get a PhD, but some of us became telescope operators. You know, they're working on Mauna Kea, Haleakala, you know, and that it's it's still being involved with astronomy, but it's not necessarily research track. That there's other, you know, there's other jobs that you can do connected to astronomy that 
doesn't require a PhD that you could still be involved with. Um, so um, how do you make them okay with being trained in something that they love to ultimately be doing something else? Yeah, that's, um, that's a tough one. And the other, the way that I would do it, you know, when I was teaching in baby astrophysics is point out the good and the bad of being in this profession. So uh, I think that, well, the, you saw my little film clip on COVID, but what isn't in there is how many, how much mental health issues were triggered by by COVID because we're already in a culture that has long work hours. Like you're rewarded for these, keeping these incredibly long hours, not doing nine to five, um, unless you're in a place that has sanity. And uh, then you do nine to five, maybe nine to four, right? But where, where are these places that have sanity? <laughs> <laughs> find them, find them. So, um, and that, you know, that's a lifestyle choice, right? And so when COVID happened, people just, you know, they just worked. They just worked, 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 worked. Um, or they didn't, or they just, you know, they were depressed and they didn't work. So it's almost by model, modal, but you know, the, the days just, they just got sucked up. It was not, it was not healthy. A lot of people just worked really, really too hard and to the point of exhaustion. Um, and so this, you know, this lifestyle is, is not ideal. And uh, so you should point out the good and the bad, right? And so that they can make that choice of uh, whether they, you know, we, we still think that, you know, smart, smart people should do astrophysics. They should think about astrophysics and think about if they have a question that they want to answer in astrophysics. And, you know, will they be happy if they answer one question that nobody else has asked or is that just the tip you know posing that first question and answering it is that the tip you want to keep doing that so i would point out the lifestyle i point out you know because a lot of students especially you know um when i was teaching when i was in a physics department uh they they the students were very uncomfortable with the idea that they were going to have to propose original research at some point, that they were perfectly ha happy taking orders. They were in like, give me homework, I will do the homework, right? Uh, give me a research question, a research topic, I will do it. But that next step of you're going to have to propose something completely original. Nobody's thought of it before. Or if they thought of it, they've never looked at it in this particular context. And that leap was, you know, not many people really wanted to do that leap. And even if you told them, we will prepare you, we're going to train you up so that you're going to be at a position that you can take that leap. Um, they still didn't sit comfortably with that. And I said, but there's a there's an issue around taking that leap. And that is you're actually the first person to actually do it. So you're jumping off a cliff. And then maybe, maybe you're the people around you, maybe you're, you're, you're a supervisor, maybe they can help you, but it's on you. You know, you're taking responsibility. You are the number one person thinking about this for four years of your life. So, you know, even that could be daunting that they can say, oh, no, nope, you know, I'm just a user, I'm gonna go, you're gonna tell me what to do and I'm just gonna be a technician, I'm gonna be support, right? So Even I then hope... you use the word just gonna be a technician, so. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that's, it's like, that, no, think... I'm not gonna be a crazy researcher that's up at hours, that's right, okay. I think that's always that barrier though is there that it's like you're, you know, you are you. So if your students say, oh, I'm gonna do this, they feel like they're criticizing your choices. And I think for a lot of teachers, it's hard to, and departments even, it's hard to express to students it's okay to do other things yes. and, and explain how hard the hours are and all these things. Because it makes you seem like, why, why the hell did I make this decision? 
Well, Joel, I, I will tell them why I made the decision because yeah. I am just not made for corporate America. Yeah. I, I like, you know, something. I like to show up at work at ten in the morning and, and leave when I want to, and you know, pick up my work at midnight if I want to. This is this is my life. Yeah. This is how I like to live my life. I don't want to be in at like eight. No. So but I think, I, I think one people. very visible way in which we can show that it is okay to do other things is by actively bringing alumni who left the field into our program to talk to our students. Yeah. First yeah. of all, that I makes think... it less daunting for them to consider other careers. And it also actually is a very visible sign that we consider those people success stories of our program. Yes, yes. But you're not doing that already? I thought that, I mean, that's we, pretty We, we are forward. doing that, okay. but not everybody is doing that yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think trying to fit it in more is important, like them threading their message in more and not just having sort of, oh, here's the alumni day of the people who didn't stay in astronomy because then you're still doing it but be like these things go there and there i know when i was at u of a i always used to like it, using the example of the chef and kit peak in the kit peak cafeteria who is totally totally obsessed and enamored with astronomy but wanted a career as a chef and then managed to combine them not that i think chefs in astronomy is a good career choice because there's even fewer of them than any other category but, but that shows you how you put of our it together <laughs> You know, you could yeah. take all of these astronomy classes yeah. while also actually you were doing your catering degree. <laughs> right. Maybe we should give a chance to Betsy, who has yeah, raised yeah, her hand as she should, to participate in the discussion. That's okay. This is a really interesting discussion. Um, yeah, I really like this this study you're doing. I guess what I'm curious about is if you sort of have any like ambitious, big picture, like recommendations that have have come out of this you know like what can we do to to deal with this issue that the way the job market is set up in astronomy like you said is so precarious requires so many moves like yes. obviously it's a huge thing we can't just you know snap our fingers and magically fix it but i'm curious if well we could if we have money Yes, if, we had if all we're the willing money. to throw money at the problem then then we could do it i would say the number one issue that I think is, is easily solved by money is that, well, people have solved this in the past by money, but when graduates don't get their first postdoc, they often find money for them in their, in their PhD department to support them for a longer period of time. And what I found was this was very gendered, right? So it tended to be men who got those kind of bridging funds and that we should make bridging funds standard and offer it to our women as well. It's like, what, you just kicked the woman out? Like when they didn't get a postdoc, you just let her walk when we're trying to retain women in the field? Are you guys insane? So that's one money issue is just to have these bridging funds. You know, if you if you would give six months of bridging funds, that's another one or two articles that they can get out, which can strengthen their um, their their CV for getting a, a postdoc, et cetera. Um, so um, so that's that's one that's one broad thing. What's another broad thing that I I, I noticed the uh, the mental health? I think fortunately, I think that uh, mental health is is on the table for the first time in a really big way because of COVID. Because so many astronomers have mental health issues uh, due to the isolation and inability to work, et cetera. So I think that uh, as a result of COVID, there was a lot of, uh, I don't know about your, um, your institution, but we have mental health days where they forced us like on Friday, Everybody at the university is on annual leave. You have to take this as a mental health day, right? And so the question is, as we're coming out of COVID, are we going to still have this sort of more caring and supportive environment, such as you will have to have a, a mental health day? Um, we have these resources and it's okay to use them. And, you know, the other ways that 
it's become more common to talk about being depressed and being feeling isolated and being unhappy, etc. So I would say that that would be the second thing that um, I would I would push for is to continue and to have the support for for mental health issues. Okay. Is that enough? I'll stop at two. Yeah, thanks. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one could naively say that maybe your first one of the bridging funds, the counter argument would be, well, we have too many postdocs already, so maybe we should offer bridging funds to nobody because it's a good way of taking the hint that some people need to leave. I know it sounds harsh, but it's it's one of, it's kind of one of those dilemmas. Not, not just harsh. It's just like why you want to go there? Why you want to say something like that? Right? We're trying to be supportive and inclusive. Like really no, think no. about that. Really think. I mean, if we have money, if we have money, because think about you know you may think we have enough postdocs, but you've actually invested four years into your graduates, mm -hmm. and your reputation, your success is. It's really built on their success. So I would argue that, you know, your graduates should be taken care of a little bit more than just any random postdoc because, you know, it's it's the reputation of your department that's at stake. So well, I'll let you chew on that. Don't argue with me. Okay, Don't argue with good. me. Okay, okay, good. Samaya. Samaya. <laughs> Hi, thank you, um, Yarita, for that really wonderful talk. I was a bit silent because it was also quite triggering, I think, also very meaningful. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm no. Sorry. I, I fit. I'm an Asian female. I have an autoimmune condition. I've experienced stalking. I've had the two body thing. So, you oh know, I realized gosh. very much of a lot, you know, thinking just as you were mm -hmm. speaking about my own personal career has obviously been very much dictated by these reasons. But a lot of these, um, things, you know, and I loved the opportunity that you've um, provided also for the interviewees to speak about these experiences, but a lot of these remain kind of hidden when we talk about staying in astronomy, yes, you know, when you apply for jobs, when you apply your, um, you know, you, you go through the hiring process, I've also sat on the other side now, yes, you know, one of the first questions is why did you apply for this position, yes, and very rarely do you and you are sort of strongly encouraged, yes, not to bring up anything on the personal side. Yes, you know, it's got to be purely scientific. And so, um, yeah, I, my, sorry, my questions are a bit confused, but um, I think that I wondered what you thought, how can we improve that situations for those obviously who do want to stay in astronomy, either in faculty positions or, you know, in, you know, other career, um, pathways and I think we are moving towards a much uh, uh, very fortunately moving towards you know this non well yeah not the faculty route being the only option yes that there are um, trans, um yeah different options that you know that we we are beginning to really I think embrace yes because the world and society is also changing in terms of career paths but i wanted to know first your thoughts yes on how we can you know really i guess open up that discussion because obviously it does impact um yeah many people as you mentioned on a very intersectional level where they are in terms of continuing in astronomy in its different guises yes so what i think the the the, the most uh um, for me, what I consider the most important issue that's happening in astrophysics department that's not talked about is transparency. So what you find is that a certain subset of students get access to this information over here, but the students, the other students don't. So there's all this unspoken knowledge or actually it's spoken, it's spoken knowledge, but it's not spoken to everybody, right? It's only spoken to a few chosen people like, oh, you know, when you're, when you're going into this field, you need to have this, this many articles. I recommend that you publish them in these places. Uh, you need to build these kinds of collaborations. Uh, you need to avoid that person. He, he's a jerk, you know, and, you know, all this, this, this information 
not is not spread evenly across the population and women and under members of underrepresented groups tend to be excluded from those really deep how do you navigate your career as an astrophysicist how do you succeed how do you be a scientist you know what are the kind of questions you should be asking and who should you be surrounding yourself how should you be spending your time you know those are those are really deep questions that we're gonna gonna help you be successful as a scientist and as a, a person who wants to be a researcher in the future. And you're, the people that you're trying to attract and retrain are being excluded from those conversations. So just be transparent. Try to get that information to every person and try to emphasize how important these conversations are, right? That, um, um, and also, um, ooh, you know, the hardest thing is not to take things personally. That's the hardest thing. <coughs> so uh, we've, we've got a lot of salty people in astrophysics, right? And, and they're like, yeah, they're low-key racist and they can be horribly sexist. But that doesn't mean that they don't have really good information about how to get from port A to B, right? And so... You've got to you've got to give your students the resilience to be able to say, look, this guy is a jerk, but he knows how to get you to like space telescope or get you to ESA, right? So realize he's a jerk, but make use of him anyway. You know, this is a really hard thing to teach. It's a it's a very much a leadership thing. But once you can master that, like, okay, this guy is I hate him but I'm gonna make him work for my career, right? I'm gonna make him work for me, right? It's a very, very tough thing to teach, but I think it's super important given that we have some very unsavory characters. They're not crossing the line. You know, they're not, well, hate to say it given the last week, but you know, they're not all sexual harassers, right? <laughs> but they're just jerks. They're just jerks, so. But I hope then, that's sorry, helpful. Yeah, just to yeah, very helpful. Just to follow on question, how do we make sort of our colleagues in hiring committees and things like this more sensitive to individual career paths? Sensitive. Yes. Please, <laughs> make make them sensitive. I'm like, they need to get with the program. <laughs> but I think like, a lot of us face the fact that um, you know, still, you know, there is this still traditional kind of metric system we use, yes, when yes. we are looking to hire <clears throat> paper publications, you know, where people have been, often these choices have been dictated, as you mentioned, by, you know, numerous conditions, numerous circumstances that are not, you know, explicitly obvious, yes, when you talk mm -hmm. to a candidate. So I just, you know, is it just, we co just constantly have to bring awareness and discuss, yes. and as you say, I was like, oh, please. Dictate. Please, <laughs> like, they, they want to forget. I'm like, from one job search to the next, it, it's like you have to retrain everybody. No, you can't talk about, no, you can't talk about their spouse unless they mention their spouse in their application, can't be talked about. No, you can't talk about their former collaboration with so-and-so unless it's in their application. You have to really focus on the paperwork in front of you. And that's what the stride method is for doing uh, job searches is you stick to the documents in front of you. You stick to the fact that this is the job description, this is their application, not anything external until they come into an interview. Because people have all kinds of opinions and you have to say, how is that opinion related to what we are seeing in front of us on this piece of paper, right? So they can't bring up external stuff that they're like, oh, well, I don't think they really come because they're from, you know, it's like they applied for the job, which means that they are serious about possibly coming here. Don't make these decisions for them. Don't bump them out of the pool um, because of some opinion that you have. It's not about opinion. It's about what is in front of you, right? So it used to be that, oh, I don't really want to um, hire her. She's of childbearing age. She's just going to have children. It's like, that is not your concern. Your concern is <laughs> to hire the person who's going to do the science, right? You cannot bring in childbearing 
into this discussion. These are all inappropriate. And of course, in the United States, it's against the law to bring these things up. And I'm trying to learn the laws here in the UK, since I've settled here, right, that they, they have something similar where there's certain things that you cannot discuss because it's against the law. So be aware of the law. And I find that, of course, astronomers are, they like think that there's no laws. I'm like, no, no, they're, they're laws. They will get you. You will be fine. You will be fired. There are laws, right? So find out your local laws about discriminatory behavior. Who do you file with? What's considered acceptable and unacceptable during job interviews um, or making job decisions? Um, also, you know that it's been proven over and over again that the, the uh, letter, people who write letters are biased, um, that people, when they see people see these, they're biased, etc. that all these biases exist and that we have to work actively to undo those. Yeah, I, I think one of the problems with those things is that the jerks also learn. So how to, how to game the system. Yeah, and so at some point you don't have to outright say, I don't want to hire her because she is of childbearing age. I mean, there are so many things in someone's oh, CV yes. that they, you can always find something to object to that is not what you're objecting to, right? Yes, yes. You are wise, Ralph. You have figured out the game, the game behind uh, the game. I mean, yeah. I this mean, is the problem this, with dealing this, with smart this people. Takes five they will, seconds. They would they would always cook up some great excuse. They will they will claim their objective up and down, and they will cook up some excuse to pop people out of the the job pool. Right? Yeah. They'll always think of something. So you have to be aware of like, okay, is this really a BS thing that they're putting forward, or is this legit? And is it on paper? Is it in their their CV in the documents in front of you? So. Yes. Thank you. That, Ilse has raised her hand. Yes, uh, I, I actually had a question, which is sort of the inverse of what we were just discussing. Um, I have four teenagers and I'm a single mom, so I run a household by myself, special needs kids. So my skill set on handling people in difficult situations is enormous. So how when I apply for jobs, how can I translate such skills into something that they're looking for? They're looking for management experience, but there's obviously in my CV at the moment, not that much absolute leading people in an astronomical setting. But I do believe that these skills that I've developed at home and in a completely different context are extremely valuable for an astronomical setting, maybe from a different perspective. How do you handle these kinds of situations? And, and do you have any advice for that from the study that you've done? So I actually do not have advice from the study that I've done, but I have advice from my life, which was um, 25 years ago, I, I did volunteership. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Fiji in the South Pacific. So I was working in a culture that was not my own. I was teaching math, physics, chemistry. Um, I was by myself and I had to you know, matriculate my, my students who were mainly from two different cultures. And so in, when I was applied, like now when people talk about teaching positions, if as a professor, you're gonna to have to teach, right? And so in my, in my description, I'll say, I have taught and, you know, culture's not my own. And I've had to handle students of diverse background at all different education levels, et cetera. And, um, and I just, just put it there and when I have to write a teaching statement. So I think in your leadership statement that you can say that you're used to handling people that have disabilities and mainstreaming them and, you know, managing um, um, conflicting schedules. And uh, yeah, so there was one guy, um, a colleague of mine in cultural astronomy who also ran a business. And he's like, I always hire the woman who is coming back after raising kids because they know how to manage everything. <laughs> I'm like, you get it. You would be the perfect chair of an academic committee. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, <stop. laughs> yeah. So they don't need to know that it came from raising your own kids. 
Mm-hmm. These are skills that you have. It should just be listed as skills. Yeah. Yeah, it, it becomes a bit tricky when you do get into the interview states and they ask you where and how you develop those skills. I, mm-hmm. I, I've, I've, I've talked to a few people where I found it difficult to make them relate to this more personal situation, whereas they were looking for a more practical uh, workplace. Uh, I think it's set. different yeah. now because of COVID. It has changed. That's I think for it's sure. because yeah. of COVID, yeah. because everybody had to learn how to manage their household with with COVID. So, and you've been obviously doing it for much longer than COVID. And I That's think true. it's legit. Yeah. I think it's COVID has really changed. May these changes stay, right? May they stay in some ways. Or maybe at least learn the positive lessons from them. It's, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So I'm not keeping track of the chat. Is there something I should be paying attention to? No, some people are saying goodbye, and and uh, Jake. Uh, oh, uh, he made a say. Jake's just randomly commenting things. Jake commented <laughs> that he is often the only person trained at anything in a hiring committee. Well, so I, I, here, everybody has to do unconscious bias training, but they've already shown that it doesn't necessarily impact people's biases. They yeah, just... I think it's one of those things where it's it, th- those courses tend to be short enough that they they make you aware of it if you weren't already, but that doesn't necessarily always help you deal with it better, right? Yeah. Practically dealing with what with the consequences of unconscious bias is a whole other kettle of fish than just understanding that it exists. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's very easy especially with things like that unconscious bias training that people can swing the other way into hyper conscious unconscious bias and be become even more conscious about not their own bias but thinking everyone else has got this bias maybe and then second guessing everything that is happening instead of actually not being biased <laughs> if you mm-hmm. see what i mean mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Jarita, you have been very patient with us yeah. and you've already lasted longer in question time than you predicted. I did. Yeah, We're I'm surprised. Live, <laughs> so I, I, I think we should start asking for the last question. So is there another burning question or comment that somebody would like to raise maybe as the last one? I really meant it. I didn't mean that the last one had already passed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to thank you guys for hosting me and, and and having it finally happen. And I see that Tana is still on the call, who you guys got to see that she's going to be in the documentary film. Yeah, so great. That's, that's very cool. And uh, a lot of people, hey, Tana. A lot of people ask for my slides, and I tend to not give the slides because the film is going to come out. So, uh, you know, in the next next year, early next year, the, the film should be ready. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And since it's already been paid for by the European Union, thank you, uh, it will be for free. So I'll probably just put it on YouTube. Oh, that's um, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, but what I would do is I would make it available for astronomers to use for lectures and things like that, um, because it has to go through a year of going through film festivals to try to get a prize, right? Oh. The whole whole goal of going to film festivals is to try to get a prize. Then it's another award-winning film. I have other award-winning films. And then oh, after that year, uh, it, I'll just put it, you know, all the way open. So pretty much... You know, I'll let the astronomers know that they can contact me and there will be a private link for the film. But then after a year, it will be a, a public link. So that's that's the plan. Oh, wonderful. Well, with that said, I would like to thank you again very much for the very interesting talk and your patient answering of many questions. Thank you very much, Sharita. Okay. Take care and everyone stay safe. We're still COVID. Absolutely. Good luck with the film. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.